Doc Marty, it's an absolute privilege to be able to talk to you tonight. Thank you so much for making the time. And um, I've really been looking forward to just talking to you about sports and healthy side of living and how to take care of yourself and make sure injuries aren't part of your life as a sportsman or sportswoman. And thank you so much for joining me tonight. And um, I want to fall right in with the first question. I just want you to also tell us a bit more about yourself, your business, your interests, what you're involved in. We can start with that. So the first thing I'll say is that I love your taste of glasses. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I notice is we both uh, have good tasting glasses. So I'll take these off for now. The, um, the sound was jumping a little bit when you were speaking. So yes. if it's, I don't know if it's coming through your side. Is it clear? It's clear. I can hear you perfectly. Isn't it? Okay, so it was jumping a little bit. If it does jump, we can always just repeat what we say and make sure that people get the information that's required. Perfect. So I didn't, I didn't 100% get the question. It was more like, a, tell me about yourself, was it? Yes. Tell me a bit about yourself, your business, your interests. Okay, so I'm a uh, chiropractor by profession. I qualified in 2004, so going into my 16th year of practice now. And... Um, have always been very excited at the opportunity to learn more and more and more about health and wellness. And when we, when I qualified, the conversations that I was having with the medical practitioners and my colleagues were very different to the, to the types of conversations we're having at the moment. So mm. what's happened is there seems to be an explosion in health and wellness around the world. And if you just look at things like discovery health, or you look at momentum and these guys are now saying, wow, Let's not spend the person's life savings on their medical savings at the end of their life and, you know, spend all that money on disease care. Let's rather start creating a proactive approach to say, let's, start to, let's take care of you while you're young so that we don't have to spend all this money on you when you're old. Yes. So we've gone from a, a reactive healthcare system that says, do what you want your body's not your responsibility. It's, the, it's your genes' fault, and your genes are broken, and you must just continue living any way you want. And what will happen is we'll give you a tablet when things go wrong and hopefully fix your problems. Mm. And people are starting to witness that that's becoming more and more problematic. We've got more heart disease than ever, more obesity than ever, more chronic diseases than ever. We've largely beaten traumatic conditions. We can, if you break your arm in an accident, man, doctors are incredible. If you mm. have acute injury, Doctors are out of this world, like for an um, acute infection. Look how well they're treating COVID-19. They do an incredible job with it. Mm. So when it's an acute infection, medicine has won by and large. But we now are living longer and we're living sicker. Mm. And the model of healthcare is going through a metamorphosis. When I first started my health and um, wellness lectures with a group of medical doctors that were importing products and they were trying to train doctors into alternatives to chemical interventions. The first lectures I attended more than 10 years ago had maybe eight people in it. And uh, the latest one I went to, there were a few hundred people. Hmm. And this is you know, South Africa. We're a small market. And yeah. to see the explosion of interest in the medical doctors and the medical profession saying, we've got to think of a new way of doing this. And it involves the patient taking the responsibility. That's what that's the real catch, and that's where we've seen the shift. People are now starting to say, okay, well, I guess my health isn't the, purely just because of my genes, mm. it's because of what I'm eating, how I'm behaving, and it's my responsibility to start doing a good job with my health. Mm. And uh, that's the area that I, I focus on. I'm a big fan of lifestyle medicine and getting people to change their lifestyles. Obviously, I'm a fan of chiropractic, you've been exposed to that. The most beautiful profession. Yeah. And uh, no, I don't. I don't struggle to get excited about what I do. You've been to my clinic. You've seen. I love what Definitely. I do. You can do. Yeah. And I love sharing. It, you know? So it's a it's a it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to get on any type of podcast and or video or vlog or anything and say, hey, I want to spread a message. Like, let's yeah. get people healthy. Yeah. Let's get them feeling better. Mm. So yeah. That's awesome, man. And um. And I, as I talk to you, I can just see that your whole outlook is focused on holistic health. You know, why is this so important to you? So, 
I was at varsity, I remember the guys would make fun of me and um, <clears throat> they would say, Marty's the guy who's going to be meditating in a corner, wishing people better with his brain, you know, and um, he'll be holding magnets over their body <laughs> and doing all sorts of weird crystal healing and Reiki. And the guys used to give me a lot of slack for that, but I was always open to the idea that the human being <clears throat> is indeed something miraculous mm. and a sensational machine to own. Mm. If you look at your body and just consider the intelligence that made this body, that put it together, the, the, the natural order that created this vessel for your consciousness to have an experience on planet Earth. Mm. It is miraculous. And it's nothing short of a miracle that you're walking around in the most incredible machine this side of the universe. Yes. It's fascinating. And it's also something we take for granted. We really do take our bodies for granted. Mm. And this thing just works. I mean, who's thinking about what my thyroid gland is doing right now? But my thyroid gland is doing its job. My hair is growing. My eyeballs are regenerating themselves. My skin is regenerating. My cat scratched me over here. In a couple of weeks' time, you won't even see that scar. I cut myself badly. Almost needed a stitch on my thumb about two weeks ago. It's completely healed over. Yes. It's fascinating. It is. I mean, it's incredible. You're a walking miracle. The fact that I can eat an apple and my body will take this apple and turn it into liver cells, brain cells, thyroid cells, skin cells. It's just miraculous. Mm -hmm. And you cannot possibly be living inside a miracle body and not say, hold on a second. Yeah, we need to investigate this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So when a therapy comes across and says, your body is a composite of cells and has got a spirit or an energetic field around it, which is proven by science. You can, mm -hmm. we, scientists have now proven there isn't an energetic field around the body, but yet it's ignored. It's completely ignored. Nobody looks into it. Why? Because there's no money thrown at it. Mm -hmm. Imagine medical doctors were going around saying, hey, guess what? We measured there's an electromagnetic field around the body and it's affected by emotions. It is affected by the way you're thinking. Mm -hmm. It is affected by every little bit of information you allow into your brain. So when you read a bad news article and you're not feeling great about the day, your energetic field contracts. But medicine's never investigated this type of stuff. So it tends to be the quacks, the chiropractors, the homeopaths, the people that are saying, hey, hold on, let's look at the whole body, mm. not just the heart as a physical pump. Most people will look at the heart and say, okay, well, we know that this thing is a physical pump, it pumps blood around the body. But when you're in love and you say, man, I am so in love right now. And you ask the person where are you are feeling the love? They go, yeah, they go to the heart. Mm. So if there's this information coming out of the heart that is being expressed as an emotion of love. And yet it's a wave. It's not a particle. So you can't exactly say, well, I'm going to put this machine on your heart. I'm going to measure how much love you've got in your body right now. Mm. So there's just so much we don't know about the body. And I think we, we come from, it's a very simplistic way of looking at the human body. If all we're going to do is look at the physical side of the body, when we know that the body is a mind, body, being. Mm. You never ever call a monkey a monkey being or a dog being. You get the word, the, the term is human being. And the reason we are called beings is because we have a body and a mind. Mm. And where one ends and the other one begins, we're starting to get very blurry and going, well, we don't actually know where the two separate. And the way I'll explain that to you is this. If I make you close your eyes for a second and think of a man walking up to you with a gun and putting it to your forehead, you'll immediately get a little bit uneasy. Mm. Your nervous system doesn't know the difference between what you've just imagined and what is real. And your nervous system, just in two seconds of saying, okay, imagine the guy's got a gun to my head, will already start producing the hormones required to overcome the traumatic incident of being robbed or being shot. It'll mm. prepare you. So it's got no idea to tell you which one you've imagined and which one is real. So we've got to start integrating these approaches into healthcare. Yes. We've got to. Because 
the time is here. We have to acknowledge that it is science. And I do think it's easy to get locked up into quackery. I think there's loads of guys out there that are selling all sorts of um, solutions that may not be deeply rooted in science. So it's, it's, you've got to be very careful to still walk on that, that balancing act and saying, hold on, I am scientific, but I'm open-minded to the fact that I don't know very much about the human body and mm. healing. In terms of how far we've come from a scientific perspective, we've got so much to learn, it's ridiculous. Wow. We know so little. It's actually crazy when you start thinking about like that. And, and as things goes along, it's, you just realize that we live in this technology crazy world. And you see all of this relating to a decline in muscle development, uh, posture changes in young athletes. Um, and what has your experience been like seeing this different shape of athlete developing because of technology and people not training as they used to or just like growing up as they used to? So just, you broke up there a second, just repeat that first bit. So, so, I, said, so, um, I, so I said, we live in a technologically crazy world at the moment, you know, everything is just driven yeah. by t- technology. And um, how do you see this in relating to a decline in muscle development and uh, foster changes in younger athletes? Yeah, I think, I don't, I don't think we were ever designed to sit and pay attention to a screen for eight hours a day. And yeah. um, the damage that we do to young children when they attend their first day of school and they get told to sit down, which puts them into a flexed, the hips go into a flexed state, the knees are flexed, shortens the hamstrings, deactivates the glutes, tightens mm. up the hip flexors, and then immediately that happens. And we get this rounding of the shoulders with tightening into the bicep and the pectoral muscles. And kids are starting to adapt these postures earlier and earlier. And then they go home and they sit on their technological device while they're driving in the car home, playing a game on an iPad or, um, you know, sitting on the phone when they get home. And from what I can recall when I grew up, um, I don't think I ever, ever spent time staring down at a screen or a monitor like it. It was get home, get undressed, get the cricket bat out, and we played cricket in the streets until the sun came. If it wasn't cricket, it was... Football, I mean, all the kids in the street got together and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to play sports. So we never ever stared at a screen. You know, one of the things I'm seeing more and more, scarily enough, is postural problems, but also anxieties. Yes. Um, young children being put on antidepressants, suffering with depression. And I think the social media world is a very dangerous one to play in, especially if your brain hasn't been formed completely. Mm-hmm. You know, the human frontal lobes only fully developed at 25 so at age 25, you are 100% responsible for the decisions you make in life. 25. It's crazy. It's, a lot of it's madness. Yeah. It's, we're giving kids exposure to decisions. They're, they're far too premature to really understand the implications of these things. And um, I think, yeah, worryingly, muscle wasting, as you mentioned, is something we're seeing more and more. I've got... Um, Kids coming into the practice that are young boys, for example, are very effeminate. They, they've um, clearly had too much estrogen in their systems and they have poor posture, feminine features. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't want anything more than to say, come on guys, into the water polo field, onto the track, sprinting, rugby, hockey, you know, get toughened up a little bit. Nice. Um, the young and, and muscle wasting, I think, unfortunately, is the end result of inadequate training in school. My PT teacher used to get us all, we'd all get dressed into PT clothing. He'd kick a soccer ball onto the screen, uh, onto the TV, mm. onto the field, <laughs> and he'd say, you go, you yeah. know, just go and play football and that was the best coaching we got if we were really lucky they got a trampoline and they'd make us jump over a horse and we do maybe a couple of push-ups and run around the gym a little bit i mean Mm. we've advanced as a society to be able to do better for kids then we can really do a lot better and i don't understand why there isn't an exercise or a program available that builds posture builds tone gets people sitting upright a half an hour every single day 
in their school career so that by the time they get to matric, they've got some muscle tone. You know, the, the, what I've been exposed to through my um, close friend and, and colleague, Craig, who's a biokineticist by trade, is gymnastic style training, which is calisthenics and, and no, no real weight lifting per se. And I've never, ever felt better. I've seen patients really turn around from having these completely collapsed postures. And six months later, you know, the shoulders are back and the chest is up and you can see that proud. Mm. There seems to be this connection between children that are walking around like this, absorbed into their own little world um, as a visitor, and, uh, and, and changing that. Yeah. And changing that, but changing that isn't it easy. Yes. And it's definitely not going to happen kicking a, soccer ball, kicking a soccer ball onto the field and saying, run. It takes a lot more effort and energy. And um, yeah, I just, I hope that people are more aware of the fact that it's available, but yeah. kids have to do something about it. I, I, I'm worried about where the cell phone generation are going to be from a spinal integrity perspective in the next five, 10 years. I, it's, I can only imagine it's going to be disastrous, uh, disastrous. It's actually scary when you say it like that. Uh, and it actually falls into my next question. So, what is the optimal, optimal way to improve or correct this? It needs to be a concerted effort to um, improve yourself. Mm. So whenever, if somebody doesn't want to change their posture, they're not going to change their posture. Mm. You know, and I think people don't want to change their posture because they don't know that it's important. Yeah. They don't know that what the importance is. I remember very clearly in school, not being very interested in certain subjects until I got told I need to do well at them before I can study to be a chiropractor. And the next minute I got a distinction. Mm. But before you told me it's important, I didn't care. And I don't think people understand just how important it is to have a spine that is upright. If we look at the natural shape of a human spine, it should, I'll draw this quickly, it should look like that. It should have curves in it. And the spines we're seeing at the moment look like that. So people are slowly but surely turning into prawns, you know, with their hands forward like this, their feet forward, they're sitting like that. And if you are sitting like a prawn and your spine is C-shaped and not S-shaped, there is no way that you are going to perform as a human being the way that your maker set out for you. There is no way that you're going to perform at sports. There's no way you're going to perform optimally in your mind at optimum. Mm. And in this day and age, do you really want to be average? <clears throat> I have people coming in all the time and saying, oh, but it's normal to have, it's normal to have back pain. Well, it's common, but it's not normal. Yeah. And we've become so convinced that common is acceptable in the world of high performance, I can tell you what, I don't want to be average. I want to mm. perform like crazy. And yeah. our maker built a spine and a human body so ready to exercise and move and go. But we, we destroy it by sitting for eight hours a day. Yeah. And then when you say, okay, well, if I look at, if I look at, if I look at tooth brushing and I ask somebody, listen, what's going to happen to your teeth if you stop brushing them um, within the next eight weeks? There'll be decay. The gums are going to start getting a bit gross. Your breath will stink. It'll be pretty stiff. Mm. Yeah, it won't be nice at all. No. So now, why do we have an approach of dental health, but yet we don't look after our musculoskeletal health in the same way? And mm. people will come in and say, yeah, 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 I do a park run occasionally. I see my physio every now and again, or I have a chiropractic visit every now and again, but then they do nothing for three months. And I go, well, that's the equivalent of not brushing your teeth for three months. You have got to have a daily practice of movement or some type of exercise. And um, it needs to be consistent and determined, you know, to, the, to wanting to be a better athlete or at least be a better human being. Mm. I hope that comes out right. Yes. You know, the constant will and determination to move your body better. There's, I just saw another picture of a lady, uh, late, I think late 70s, very obese, in terrible shape, 
complete transformation. A couple of months later, this woman's ripped. She's jacked, muscles everywhere, full head of gray hair, but she's just completely transformed her life. And guess what they used? They used weight training. You don't see that lady on a treadmill. All these things that we thought, no, no, no. Health and wellness is going to Virgin Active and running on a treadmill for an hour, three times a week. No, no ways. I think that's where, where I'm a big fan of telling people, go pay somebody who knows what they're doing to help you. Now, I've got family members that are still so convinced that they have to go run on a treadmill because that means they're healthy. Yeah. That's the last thing you should be doing. Your body has been sitting since you were in grade one, and now you want to run. You're designed to sit. Your body's ready for that. So we've got to, I'm a big fan of incorporating a trainer, using a coach, using somebody who understands what the end goal is, and mm. then ha- allowing you to, to reach that goal without getting injured or hurting yourself. And that's why I'm a big fan of coaches. I've got to coach myself. You have to. You've got to push for it. Yes, and it's so true, you know, uh, you need a guy or a girl who specializes and know what they're doing because if you want to train for a certain sport, but you've got no idea how to develop the certain muscles that you need to be able to perform in that sport, you are going to hurt yourself. That's just the bottom line. Yeah. That's you know, crazy. and you want to, you, injuries can set you back so far and mm. you can be the most determined athlete, but if you can just prepare the human body and prepare the tissues for the season with somebody who knows what they're doing, just reducing that injury can be a game changer. It can be a game changer. And I've seen, I've seen athletes lose, lose uh, scholarships. You know, this can have lifelong implications for you. It's a real, it's a real no brainer to get a coach and to get somebody who can take care of you properly. I definitely, I can't uh, even, Take that as not for granted, say. Eh? And Martin, you know, I want to go into something a bit more personal. Now, you, you've been through a lot in your life as well. So how did this influence you in the way of living and your outlook in life? Sure. Yeah, if you say I've been through a lot, I guess so. I've, um, I've had a couple of moments in my life where, um, you know, death, the loss of people I care about, my best friend passed away when I was 15 and he died right next to me. <clears throat> um, there was a, clearly a moment there mm. where I recognized that I was given another chance by God. And I, um, my best friend, when he died, he didn't, him and I had the same injuries. Mm. He died, I didn't. And I've always been grateful for the fact that I was saved or protected and not... Um, you know, I didn't cross over to the other side. And mm. I think when that happened, I recognized that every single incident in your life that hurts your ego or attacks your sense of well-being or makes you feel threatened or takes something away from you that you love is an incredible opportunity for you to bounce back and respond with love, with kindness and with an a, a determined will again to become a better human being. Mm. And I remember very clearly after my best friend passed away that friends in school would say, Hey man, I wouldn't have handled seeing somebody die next to me. I would s- totally start have, like doing drugs and I would have been drinking. And I'd look at them and I'd kind of, but, but how's that going to fix my friend? It's not going to bring him back. True. But what I could do is in his memory, become a better version of myself Mm. and hopefully honor his loss by becoming a good human. So I think, I think having a moment in your life where you've really been hurt or you've really lost something you care about is the split second you have where you can become bitter or you can become better. And um, there've been a few moments in life where I've thought, wow, you know, it's, it's so much easier to just be angry and blame someone else. And the older I get and the wiser I get, the more I start going, you know what? Every single thing that's happened to me in my life has happened for me mm-hmm. so that I can grow in a positive direction. So when the proverbial S hits the fan, 
it's the universe is conspiring to make you grow. You've got to look at that and go, okay, in what way can I be better? But I can promise you one thing, being resentful, angry, bitter, never fixes anything, never turns that crisis into an opportunity, ever, ever. So rather look at it that way. And uh, I think it softens the blow when bad things happen. Yeah, true. Is to, you know, to constantly almost brainwash yourself into seeing the good, seeing the good, seeing the good. And I recently had an, lately I just gave up uh, social media and I'm having the most profound epiphanous moments realizing just how negative I was mm. and how I was allowing other people's stories to enter my mindset. And through that, I was filtering how South Africa's this and the politicians are that and, and really constantly telling myself negative stories so much so that I had to say, right, enough with social media. And three weeks in, I feel like a new person. Mm. And I think it's very easy for us to get caught up in into buying other people's negativity. You know, the maker only gave you one thing in life. You will only control one thing in life. It is your mind. It's the only thing you're going to control. Not even your body. Your body's going to get old. It's going to frot. It's going to die. Yeah, and you're not in control of that. And we love to yeah. think we're in control of it. We love to think we're in control of the weather and politics and, you know, the story of the day. We are in control of nothing. God is in control of everything. And I think when you do recognize that you are only given a choice, your maker gave you the choice to witness the good or at least recognize the good in everything. And there's always good in everything. Yeah. Always. Mm. You know, when you see this bomb that went off in Beirut, absolutely tragic, horrific what went on. I don't know if you saw that bomb. Yeah, it's horrible. But it's, it's terrible. But when you view, when you view those videos, you see helpers everywhere, good people getting out of their comfort zone, going to help one another. That's the natural state of man. Man in his natural state wants to be a good citizen, wants to be a proactive person helping society. That's your baseline state. Mm. Social media and the news doesn't want you to think that though. And that's what I needed to, re I recognized that within myself. I became antagonistic. I became blameful. I blamed the ANC for everything. Can't blame anyone other than yourself because that's you're so in charge of your mind. Yeah. No, you're in charge of your mind. The only way the ANC can upset me is if I allowed the information from the ANC to get into my brain. I created a story out of it. And then the hormones in my body were released and created something called anger or frustration. That means it's your choice. Yeah. It's your choice. So if you're not in control of that right now, maybe just saying, all right, back off. Let's not read the news. Let's not look at Facebook. Focus on family and friends that you can actually have an influence on. That's been really pivotal in uh, my growth this year. It's been a good lesson for me. Trying to keep this thing positive all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, that's such a great challenge, you know, and I want to move from that to a little bit more into your practice now and, I want to ask you, what is, the, what is one of the most important tips as a health professional that you can give today to today's young sportsmen and women? So, um, we've had a revolution in, in the way people view food as fuel. Mm. And... You know, we used to have this thing called carbo loading. You got to chow 15 things of pasta before that marathon tomorrow, and how that's being debunked <laughs> out, of, out of the window. Mm. And we, we, we used to believe these absurd things, and I think that what we believe now might be viewed as absurd in the next 10 years. But yeah. at the moment, I think focusing on foods that are high nutrient, low calorie foods is a really good good thing. So let me, let me see if I can make that clearer. If you can avoid refined or processed foods, mm. it's a good idea. Okay. These foods weren't available a hundred years ago. Your body looks at them and says, I don't recognize half of these chemicals. I don't recognize half of these proteins. These are all brand new. Let me just get my immune system on a little bit of alert because I don't recognize these. So people are mildly inflamed for a long period of time. And the last thing you want as an athlete is inflammation in the body. And guess what the number one poison is? 
that I want to call a poison because we're having it in too much of a dose. It's mm. sugar. Yeah. We have got to rethink our relationship with sugar. Now, if you take a food and you turn it into a medicine and you say, okay, well, guess what? We've got, um, let's take caffeine. If I take a cup of coffee, my cat's loving the seat over here. <laughs> take a cup of coffee, it's, it stimulates you a little bit. If you have 20 cups of coffee, it'll probably put you into a mild coma. So it'll sedate the body completely and you'll be really sick. If you have 30 cups of coffee, you'll probably die. Mm. So the difference really? between a medicine, which is either a stimulant or a sedative, and then finally a poison is the dosage. Mm. So sugar, there's nothing wrong with sugar. But the amount that we're getting it in our diet is crazy. It's way too much. We have way too much sugar in our diet. When Alf was first introduced to this, I told the lady who mentioned it to me, I said, but I barely have sugar in my diet. I don't have any. She said, okay, well, do you have tomato sauce on your burgers? I went, yeah. She said, there's, there's sugar in there. Tomato and onion mix. You go get a normal tomato and onion mix, which says tomatoes and onions. Yeah. And then when you look on the ingredients, it says tomatoes, onions, sugar. It's like, what? Why would they put sugar in there? You look at your mustard, it's got sugar in there. You look at your mayonnaise, there's sugar in there. There is sugar in everything. And the amounts that we're getting now in a month are what people 200 years ago were maybe eating in a whole year. The dosage has gone from medicinal to poisonous. And this is why chronic inflammatory conditions are rampant. People are getting diabetes. People are getting obese. We've got to remove sugar. And I'm always worried when I see an athlete come into the practice and they've got a bottle of Lucozade and they're coming with a recurring hamstring injury and I go, hold on. Chronic inflammatory conditions in the body can be promoted by diet. You know, and the parents look at me and go, what? Like, I didn't know that. You mean a hamstring that keeps on tearing and doesn't want to heal correctly is related to diet? I go, yeah, Absolutely. You know, do you think that your body is at an optimal state of being when you've got a hangover? If I made you drink 12 beers tomorrow, tonight, mm. and then I want you to run tomorrow morning, you're very likely to get injured on that run. You're not yeah. going to perform. You're not going to do great. Your body is in a subdued state of health and, and optimal well-being. Now, the vast majority of people have got this sugar hangover. They have a leucosate before they train or they have an energate just afterwards. It's too much sugar. Mm. And it's not common it's not uncommon for me to find um, a soft drink that's got 11 teaspoons of sugar in it. You know, and just because we're skinny and we're young and we're athletic and we look great and tight, we think, oh, I can get away with it. The thing is you can't get away with it when the hamstring injury arrives. Mm. That's the problem. Because yeah. now that hamstring injury has got chronic inflammation to deal with in the rest of the body and it takes you a week longer to recover. So guess what? You missed that very important game. Mm. And if you're going to become an elite athlete, if you're going to become an optimal human being, one day off the field matters. One day. So and if true. that means that you need to give sugary drinks, you've got to give up the sugar. I'm really not a big fan. I think that's probably Dr. Rhonda Patrick is a lady that I follow and I listen to her research all the time. And she's a brilliant researcher. She speaks for about one hour on how refined sugar is bad for you. And she just throws literature out nonstop. And it seems like it's probably the easiest thing you could do for your health with the biggest rewards. It's just to start reading the label. And if it says there's sugar in it, you don't drink it anymore. Yes. I think that would probably be, that would probably be my number one hack, my bio hack. Mm. And you could start improving your health. And if you're young, you should do this and make your parents do the same thing. Mm. Because you don't want your parents to hit 65, become diabetic. Guess who the biggest risk factor is right now for COVID-19? People with right. diabetes. Yeah. People that have had too much sugar for too long. They've been drinking a Coca-Cola three times a week for the last 20 years. They didn't know. But guess what? We live in an information age now where this information is coming out. And people mm. know about it. And if you've watched this now, now you know. Now you've got no excuses. You must give up sugar. It's a really, really worthwhile intervention. 
And it's very interesting eh? and it's so important, especially for the young kids. Eh? They really need to understand how important this is. Martin, and I want to come back to something. You know, we've been coming a, come a long way and you've tutored a lot of my athletes with great success to total health. What drives you when a patient walks into your rooms and you have to get them back to full health? So there was a there was actually a day that I um, drove past my clinic once. I went to the bush, and on my way home, I used to live very close to the clinic. I drove past the clinic, and uh, I looked up at my big sign there, and I said, oh, "I can't wait. I've got work tomorrow." You know, and I I thought about it. I thought, "What? I hardly ever hear a friend of mine say they're looking forward to going to work tomorrow." Yeah, and in my head. That evening, I was like, what, what is it that I enjoy? I, why do I enjoy going to work? Like, what, what do I get? Mm. And I thought about it, and I didn't really get to an answer. And the next morning, I arrived at work, and the lady walked into my room, and uh, let's call her Joan. I said, Joan, how's your headaches doing? And she went, Doc, since your treatment, gone. And the sense of well-being just... It's like angels singing to me and comes over my body. I just get this great sense of like, ah, that feels so good. And as that, as I started feeling that, I went, that's it. That's why I enjoy what I do. Because when you see people suffering become less and you've done it without surgery, without drugs, without chemical interventions, and it's affordable and it's available and it's safe, mm. come on. How can you not be excited? You know, you've, been able, yeah. you've been able to witness the power of a good spinal manipulation. A good adjustment can have you getting off that table going, this is the best medicine I've ever taken. True. You've experienced it and it's yeah. beautiful. I get adjusted by my chiropractor. So, yeah, the, 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 the feel good factor of seeing somebody improve who they are as people is is addictive as a chiropractor. It's addictive as a, imagine you as a coach, when you mm. see one of your athletes win a race, there's no better feeling. Like it did, you, didn't, you didn't have to be the one winning the race, yeah. but you're still sharing in their story and being able to share in that story and get a victory out of it. I'm sold. I'll do this <laughs> until I'm <laughs> uh, That's the best. And then uh, my next question actually comes a little bit part of the, the previous one, and I, and I want to know from you is how big of a part does mental health play in sports? Sure. You know, what we see a lot overseas is there's even mental coaches. So I worked with um, a national team. I was very privileged to work with a national team for a short while and watched how they had a mental coach and somebody who would get their headspace into the right place. Now, if anybody's ever played this ridiculous game called golf, you will really realize just how powerful the mind is in terms of your performance and your output as a sports person. If you walk up onto that green or onto the, onto the tee and yeah. say, ah, oh, no, I'm going to get the shot wrong, you will get that shot wrong. Mm. And it's as if the body just says, all right, well, whatever the mind says, I will do. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm seeing younger athletes, more and more young patients coming into the practice, suffering with things that adults typically suffered from, things like anxiety. You know, a 16-year-old girl struggling with anxiety. Um, this is new to me. It's something I haven't I've noticed in practice. And I still think this, the chief driver for mental, um, let's call it, Aberrant patterns, aberrant mm. behaviors is lack of quality sleep. Dr. Matthew Walker does a podcast with Joe Rogan. Mm. I probably have listened to it 20 times. When you look at the science behind sleep and the effect that sleep has on the human psyche, I cannot believe that sleep isn't a course that we all have to learn about. You know, when you're asleep as a species, you're not... You're not making babies. You're not making food. You're vulnerable to attack. Other tribes can come in and steal your stuff. Mm. You just lie there. Now, na natural wisdom 
said that, imagine we as a species evolved. Why on earth would sleep still be around? Surely we would have just said, okay, mammals, you're at attack. You're not making babies and you're not making food. You're not protecting your families. Let's get rid of sleep. Mm. And you would have thought that the brain says, yeah, we're going to get rid of it. But, but guess what? You need between seven and nine hours of sleep. And it's as if we treat sleep with the sense of like, ah, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Or about, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, this, yeah. like, I'm gonna, I've got FOMO. I'm missing out on life. And since I personally have started emphasizing sleep hygiene and getting off the phone a little bit sooner, not having super bright lights in the house, um, playing softer music, getting off the TV, reading a book, there is no doubt that you'll, you'll find benefit. And I think the sleep to mental status link is quite clear. And, and it's such an easy fix. Imagine how smart God is when he says, all you need to do is sleep. And I'll just fix your brain for you. No problem. Just think about it. That it's yeah. free. You can just sleep an extra hour on weekends and go, thanks God, that was easy. I mean, what a pleasure. It's a pleasure what a pleasure. Right? So from a mental perspective, I think, personally speaking, um, social media is, is a potential source of trouble. It's a potential source of receiving information into the mind and telling yourself stories that aren't real. Mm. And uh, it's those stories that make you hit that golf ball wrong. So the tools that more and more sports people are starting to use are things like meditation. And meditation is about taking the mind and learning to focus the mind first and learning how to take the mind from this busy, 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 lots of thinking to just focusing on the breath and doing that five days, five days a week for five minutes, you can close the eyes and just take the mind and say, right, I want to focus on what the air feels like going into my nose and coming out of my nose and doing it for five minutes. And there's more and more concrete evidence and more studies coming out saying meditation is medicine. And if we don't want to call it meditation, we're uncomfortable with it. We can call it mindfulness or we can call it prayer. But I do think having a few minutes every single day where you close your eyes and you go into a quiet state and just say, all right, well, let me learn to focus the mind on one thing. Now, the one thing you'll be doing and have been doing since the second you were con born is breathing yeah. and that's the one thing if you're not doing you're not here on this planet anymore but you'll always be breathing so spend five minutes a day focusing on your breath and you'll be amazed at how much the stories that tell you that you need to worry about the exams next week or you should be a richer person because if you had more money then you'd be more popular or you too fat and you need to lose weight in order to have that girl like you or that boy like you, We've, that, that's all stories. Mm. That's all nonsense. That's either being programmed into the magazines you're reading, the internet that you're taking in, and it's not valid. And we've lost the ability to focus on, remember what I spoke about earlier? I said the brain doesn't know the difference between an imagined gun to my head versus yeah. one that really is there. Well, mm. We need to start learning about, okay, hold on. How can I take my mind and just focus a little bit on what's real? And what's real is your breath. You're always breathing. Yeah. And just taking the mind and saying, for five minutes, I'm going to focus on breathing in and breathing out. And then once you can learn to focus on breathing in and breathing out, you can practice something called visualization or imagination, mm. where you then start to see in your mind's eye what it's like winning that medal, crossing that finishing line jumping that hurdle, achieving that goal. But nobody can visualize correctly until they've taken control of the mind and learned to focus. And I think you've recently started meditating as well and you're also yes, getting benefits. I mean, we walk around in this body, this flesh suit, this like very intelligent monkey, and we know it has a mind. Everyone focuses on, give me muscles, let's become sports people, but nobody ever focuses on the mind. Mm. It's super, super, super powerful to just begin a practice of mindfulness on a daily basis and you can't believe how hard it is to calm the mind down.
when you can master that, oh, you will be so far ahead of your competitors. It's not even a joke. <laughs> yeah, it's actually so, so true and so important, you know, for a lot of the kids that I work with and uh, who I coach, you know, you can see the miners all over the place, you know, it's not even focused on just a specific thing like warming up. So just to focus on training your mind to get into a simple yeah. thing like focusing on just loosening my muscles to train can make a massive difference in performance. So do you do you spend a lot of time warming up your your clients? Yes, yeah, so I spend quite a bit of time learning them what the proper way of warming up is and how you should don't do dynamic stretches. I don't do a lot of static stretching. So I focus on warming up in movement so that you get ready to do harder, more intense work through that. Mm. So yeah. You know, do you find the people that don't do the warm-ups get injured more often? Definitely. Definitely, you know, and you can you can just have a look at your, your smaller kids and then your kids going through high school into their senior years, how more important it is to do a proper warm-up. You know, you can get away with a five or ten minute warm-up if you're younger, but as you get older, you get to 16, 17 years old, you can't just do a little jog and a stretch and then you're ready to go. You have to take the time to proper loosen your body before you start doing intense work. So now when you look at your, if you've got a, a spectrum of people that you take care of, or at least are coaching, how many people can touch their toes without bending their knees? I can count them on one hand. It's terrible. Mm. You know, I think as a, as a performance coach or somebody, it's one of the first things I do when a client walks into my room. I go, okay, cool. See if you can touch your toes. And some people can't even get to their knees. knees yeah. They get to their knees. And it's, a, it's like, well, now we know why you have back pain. Like we've just <laughs> yeah. solved the riddle. We don't need to do any more. We've got to get those hamstrings working correctly and fix that. It's such a simple fix, but ask somebody to stretch their hamstrings every day. I'll do okay. And I think maybe that's the puzzle. That's, that's part of the puzzle that you and I and other coaches need to solve is how do we make that seem fun, how do we make stretching seem like it's an essential part of life? Mm. Um, so in true. the same way that I don't, ever, I don't ever go to my basin and brush my teeth and go, oh, I've got to brush my teeth. Uh, I hate brushing my teeth. It sucks. Because I know if I don't wake up, if I don't brush my teeth, I wake up the next morning, my breath is terrible. It was a bad idea. I yeah. just know that for me to have good teeth for the rest of my life, I'm going to look after them. But why don't we do the same for our hamstrings? Yeah. You know, getting to people at a school level, I think that's the key. Mm, you know, is. every single kid in grade one should be told, all right, you all did maths and geography and whatever studies. Now we're going to spend 10 to 15 minutes stretching our hamstrings and then practicing mindfulness. Imagine we could teach meditation to young kids. Mm. I think we, yeah, we could change the planet. That's good for you. Change the planet. Yeah. And, you know, Amazing. talking about that, you know, there's a lot of people nowadays are moving to a more healthier style of living, you know, yeah. away from all the chemical treatments and stuff, they use, pills they use for diseases. What would you say is the best way to start living more naturally? Um, there's so much we can do. The best way to be more natural. You know, I think following... There's a poem that says, the best six doctors anywhere, no one can deny it, mm. are sunshine, water, rest, and air, exercise, and diet. I think it's a poem by W.C. Field. And, I mean, if we just look at the, the basics, I do love the fact that our creator gave us all the tools required to be healthy for free. You do not pay money to go lie in the sun for 10 minutes a day. Yeah. You don't pay money for that. Five We've got running water. You know, the vast majority of us are so absolutely privileged to have running water. Mm. But yet we go and we drink a Lucozade or an Energade on the way to work or on the way to, to the track. So sunshine, water, rest. Again, when it comes to rest, what are we talking about? Quality sleep. Yes. I've got so many clients that say, man, I sleep for 10 hours on a Saturday. And then they wake up, they're completely exhausted. They're not sleeping quality. If you ask them what their mind is like while they're sleeping, it's turning over. It's busy, 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 busy. 
that can be corrected <clears throat> if you go online and you start studying something called sleep hygiene. The basics of initiating a good night's sleep. Um, rest and recovery goes hand in hand with that. I've got so many clients, particularly of the CrossFit guys, that feel that life needs to be train, 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 push, 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 push. And you tell the guy, well, when last did you have a rest day or a period to recover or some, some active rest? Did you go get some massage therapy? And it's never. Mm. It's never. And when their performance starts to drop off a little bit, guess what they do? They'll take a power, a, a, a stimulant trick, like a pre-workout, mm. which is just pro-inflammatory. It's going to end up making you injured in the long run anyway. And, and probably um, full of sugar. Yeah, full of stuff that's not going to help you recover. Yeah. Um, so for me, rest is so important. Again, but rest can be prescribed by having a coach who understands what the process is like and somebody who knows when their athlete needs some time out. Mm. One of the challenges we've had, you and I have shared this, is a mother who really wants her daughter to run next month and there's nothing you can tell her that's going to make her calm down. Her daughter better be running next month. And you're like, well, this poor girl is 16 and has had pain for a year and a half and it's going to take some time to recover. You know, one of the things I tell my parents when parents of patients and they're like, yo, but I've got to have this girl ready. It's got to be sorted out. And I go, okay, well send God an email and send him a complaint and tell him that he made it too long for these injuries to recover. Go moan at God. Don't moan at me because yeah. the body takes time to heal. The fact that this cut on my hand over here healed within two weeks I can only provide an environment where it's safe for this to heal. I can put a plaster on it and not pick it every day. Mm. But the body's got its own natural built-in clock of how long it's going to take to heal. And I think recovery and rest is a phenomenal way to um, optimize that, mm. really to optimize that. There was a study, Matthew Walker speaks about it, where they, they interrupted people's sleep and they told them, listen, they, they interrupted them so they only got four hours of sleep in a night. The next day, their T cell count, which is a little like, it's, it's a cell that looks like Pac-Man, and they go around, they eat all the little invaders in the body. Their activity decreased by 70% the next day. So one night of four hours of sleep, and they had a reduced immune function of those T cells by 70%, which puts you at risk. So now all of a sudden, you get on a train, somebody sneezes next to you, your immune system's dropped by 70%. Guess what? You've got a cold now. Yeah. Now, you, now you're out of training for a whole week. Why? Because you didn't sleep correctly. Sleep is an incredible medicine. And mm -hmm. again, it's, it's ignored as well as recovery and mm -hmm. rest. Super important. So it's sunshine, water, rest, and air. What did we say with the meditation? Breathe. Yeah. Breathe. Just take in air and really understand what it's like to breathe in fresh air. Is, uh, we, I see often <laughs> shallow breathers. And I'll stop the patient and say, listen, give me a favor. Let's close our eyes for a second and take a nice deep breath in. And fill those lungs. Fill them, fill them, fill them, fill them, fill them, fill them, until it, it's almost sore. Get them so full of air. And then and breathe out. Feel what it's like to fill your lungs with life, with air. Beautiful medicine right there. It's free. You don't have to pay anything for it. Okay. Other so, ones, air, exercise. Exercise and diet. Exercise obviously depends on the type of training that you do. That's where, again, get a trainer. Yeah. And then diet. From a dietary perspective, it's quite simple. Eat more plants. Eat real food. So if it comes in a plastic packet and it's full of colorants, chances are it's not good for you. Yeah. And don't eat so much. Don't eat so much. The vast majority of us are overeaters. We have two plates of food or three plates of food, a couple of snip chips, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. Most of us are eating far too much. And um, yeah, increasing plants in your diet is a very, very, very worthwhile thing to do. It seems like we were supposed to have done that a, lot, a long time ago and the industries that promote the use of meat and animal products are 
reluctant in letting us know that the science says we need to tap off on our animal products a little bit. And you can see there's an explosion worldwide of people going, hey, I'd like a plant-based meal, please. I mean, Woolworths is selling herb, like vegetable patties. And this was unheard of 15 years ago. Yeah. Unheard of. But there's a revolution happening around the world and people are starting to say, okay, eat more plants, eat real food, and not too much. Don't eat so much. Take it a little bit easy. Okay. Like these guys that come into my, my clinic and they've got a a 200,000 rand mountain bike on the back of their car. But he's got a book out there from smashing those brandy and Cokes from Thursday to, to Monday. And he wants to out cheat that by buying a light bicycle for 200,000 bucks. If you just lost five kilos, your cycling time would be so much higher. And you know how you lose five kilos? You get rid of sugar, yeah. you eat more plants, and you don't eat too much. And you Simple. finish. Yeah. Simple. So awesome, Martin. Um, my last yeah. question for you is, uh, I know I work with a lot of young people and my, my channel is actually focused on just giving some wonderful advice like you've given us tonight um, just to help them through their careers. And I want to ask you, what would your advice to a young talent in any sport be to make sure that they achieve their optimal peak performance in a holistic point of view? Mm, get a coach I think getting a coach I think finding somebody who is a specialist at what they do and then pay money for that a good friend of mine came up to me at one time he said you know what Marty you are the reason why I lost 18 kilograms I think it might even be 21 kilos and I kind of looked at him and went oh what did I do and he said you told me that I shouldn't try to do everything myself mm. I should pay somebody who's a specialist to get me the results that I want. Mm. So he says he went and paid a dietitian and a personal trainer and a health coach to put him into peak, into, in a peak performance state. He lost so much weight, he could barely recognize it. And I just thought there's such a lesson there because the amount of times we've all thought, okay, well, I'll go to gym and I'll try to become the best football player or I'll become a basketball player. Let me watch these YouTube videos. There is nothing that substitutes having a good coach, somebody that you can confide in, really, really, really work on a goal together as a team. Mm -hmm. the, that isn't money spent, that's money invested. That's money invested. So I'm, I know I'm pushing you as a coach, clearly, but I truly believe that. I think there's so much wasted talent out there because parents like to think that they are athletics coaches and they're soccer coaches and they're swimming coaches. They're not like recognize it and pay somebody who's a professional to extract that potential out of your child or out of yourself. Makes sense. It does. Martin, thank you so much. You know, um, we've been, we've been together and we've worked together for a long time. You know, um, I really appreciate the way you look at things and always when I come to your practice and you go out there for my treatments, you always feel better and positive and thank you for, for just always being the guy who's you go to you and you know you're going to get some positive news out of you and you always just focus on yeah. being, being healthy and I want to thank you for talking to me tonight and I hope that uh, everything goes well in your practice please be safe, I know this is a difficult time for everybody but um, it's nice to have positive yeah. people like you and uh, I, I wish you all the best for your practice and may everything just go well for the, for the next of the year Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. We'll do this Thanks. again. Thanks, Marty. All the best. Cheers, man. Cheers. Bye-bye.